and just give me a few minutes to finish the setting up of the, the streaming. All right, perfect. Well, hi everyone. I'm Carolina Cooney from the Oak Bluffs Public Library. And thank you very much for being here for our book talk today with Kathy Barrow. Is it Barrow or Barrow? <laughs> we'll find out. So Kathy is the, sorry, my computer's gone very slow for a moment. I'm pulling up her biography. Well, Kathy is a writer for the Washington Post. She writes a monthly column now that we were just talking about right before this. That sounds wonderful. And also she has recently come out with a new cookbook called When Pies Fly. And maybe she wants to jump in and, and do a biography because my, my computer has frozen, unfortunately. Do you mind jumping in and doing a little bio, Kathy? Oh, hi. I think I'm looking and I think most of you know me. Hi, Steve Oswald, I haven't seen you. Um, uh, I've been in the uh, surrounding the food world, I guess, for about 12 years, came out of landscape design in the 2008 um, economic shakeup uh, and started uh, publishing recipes here and there on Food 52, which was my launching pad to a career that I never could have imagined in my 50s. And now I'm entering another decade. Um, so I've written for the Times and the Washington Post for all the major magazines and online sites. I've been very fortunate. I've had three books. Uh, my first, Mrs. Wheelbarrow's Practical Pantry, is a preserving book and won the IACP award for best single subject cookbook of the year. And then I wrote Pie Squared, nominated for James Beard, which was very exciting. And the follow up, uh, When Pies Fly, that we're here to talk about today. And I'm working on my fourth, which is Bagels, Schmears, and a Nice Piece of Fish. And that's a little book from Chronicle that'll be out in February 2022. So there you go. Well, that is fantastic. Thank you so much. And very exciting news about your, your new book and the schmears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I look forward to that. So first, what we're going to start with is a little demo that Kathy pre-recorded in her own kitchen. And so it's a short video that I will share with you. Give me a moment to pull that up. Oh. Technology. I know, exactly. <laughs> you think you have everything all ready to go and. I thought about doing this live, but it just seemed like trying to do a live demo and Zoom and everything else was like beyond my pay grade. <laughs> video ahead. It took three times to video it because my husband uh, forgot to turn the video part on twice. Oh, really? <laughs> Just appreciate that I ate a lot of galette. <laughs> Let's see. What it wants to do now is not show the screen that I want to share. So let me try another way. In the meantime, I'm happy to answer any questions about Thank you. Flying pies. <laughs> the pies have been flying. It's a great season for pies right now. Galettes are on my um, must make list almost every week with whatever fruit is lying around the kitchen, unless I make jam. I mean, the thing is pies and jam are really closely aligned. They both come from grapefruit and, uh, or great ingredients that you either wrap in pastry or put in a jar, I guess. Um, I've been making a lot of galettes. The fruit's been beautiful this year. It has been good fruit this year. I'm looking forward to seeing if some of my peaches make it. 
Yeah, I didn't get any fruit from my trees. The squirrels got it all. That's Everything. what sometimes will happen. <clears throat> my dog has killed nine squirrels. Oh my goodness. <laughs> what an animal. Uh, my neighbors want to borrow him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have it ready enough here. So I will go ahead and play it. How's it going? Did it stop sharing it? Yes. Okay. One moment. <laughs> All right, my apologies. We'll try one more time. We might not actually be able to. That's OK. <laughs> it plays fine for me, but it doesn't like the streaming. Your system isn't supporting it. I think it's just too much. It's overload. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to open it up to questions if you just want to do that. That actually would be great. It's just not okay. going to do it at all. I'll be happy to talk about the book a little bit. So my pie situation. I've been a pie maker for a really long time. I started out when I was in my early teens. My stepdad never liked a cake for his birthday. He liked sour cherry pie because his birthday fell right when sour cherries were always ripe, which was the 10th of July. And I made that pie every year for like decades. And one year um, I entered it in a local pie contest. And this is really how my food career took off because the judge of the pie contest was the editor of the Washington Post recipes. And she was very delighted with my pie and gave me a blue ribbon, which one is never too old to get, and then asked me to start contributing recipes. And that was a really exciting moment for me and completely unexpected. But I began to understand that pie making didn't come as naturally to everyone. You know how when you're good at something, you just don't really think like, isn't everybody good at this? It's no big deal. But I found out that pie making was a challenge for a lot of people. And I spent time trying to break it down to make it easier. Um, first with my stepbrother who kept saying, your mom's pie crust was so good and I've been trying 25 years and I still can't make it. And I wrote recipe after recipe after recipe until he finally said, oh my gosh, this is just like hers. So um, you know, pie making, it, it's It seems we've have... lost your sound there, Kathy. It says my internet connection is unstable. I have no idea what that means. Can you hear me now? No? Let me take this out. I can hear you, but I can't see you. Oh, now I can see you. Are you okay now? All right. Um, so I've been making pies and I started Pie Squared and that was when I first 
leapt from sweet pies into savory pies. Even though I'd been making chicken pot pie forever, I never like expanded the savory concept beyond chicken pot pie. And suddenly I thought, well, what about a beef stew pie? Or what about a cauliflower pie? Or what about a nacho pie or a Frito pie, and chili pie? And, and I had so much fun with it. But all along, I was making these, in, these slab pies that served like eight, 10 people. And it's just me and Dennis. And I kept thinking, I need to make smaller pies, littler pies. And that is what naturally led to when pies fly. It was the uh, plethora of plastic containers filled with little bits of pie filling in my refrigerator and little bits of pie dough. And at the end of every week, when I'd say, okay, I got to clean this fridge, I would just start forming empanadas or hand pies, or what I came to call pie poppers. Or I would find ways to use spring roll wrappers or puff pastry or other things to make individual pies. And from there, that's how when pies fly sort of sprang into action. So I'll, I'll take any questions. I don't just want to yammer here, but you'll have to unmute everybody. <laughs> I've unmuted quite a few of you, if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask. I'd love to see more of the cookbook. I see you have it behind you. Maybe you can show us some of the recipes you have in there. I'm sorry, I just lost you for one minute. Can you repeat that question? Oh, I said, I'd like to see more of the cookbook. I see you have the cookbook there behind you. Yeah, hold on. Okay, so there are little hand pies like this, which are and Are great. those hand fruit pies? This is a lamb, it's filled with oh. lamb Rogan Josh, which is so a- So is that a little like an empanada? I know there are empanadas in here too. There are empanadas too? Yes, there are. Many. I always wanted to make those and I never have. Maybe that'll be something I'll have to conquer. Absolutely. Um, they're not only, hold on a moment. Let me see if I can get to that section. Um, there's a lot of fun things yeah. here. I'm very pleased with the strudels particularly. Uh, so there are baked empanadas and also fried empanadas and little um, oozy cheese empanadas. But then I love these, which I call empanaditas, little empanadas. And oh, those my. are filled with tomato jam and cheese, uh -huh. pretty good. Um, and yeah, there's a, a lot of different uh, types of pie. I, I took it upon myself to just expand the whole notion of what pie might be, anything wrapped in dough. This is true, I yeah. like that. Yeah, so that's, uh, it's been a, a really fun ride. I've had a good time with this book. In the summer, do you do much baking or do you typically do that in the, the fall and the winter and spring? Oh. Technology. Can't hear me? Now I can. Okay. I was asking if you do much baking in the summer or you mainly stick to the fall, winter, and spring for the baking. I, I bake all the time, every day. Every day? Whether Yeah, I, I bake something. Cookies, wow. bread, um, pies, cakes. Yeah, I bake and I give it away. Really? That's nice. Yeah, what did you bake today? Or what will you be baking? I baked bagels this morning and mm -hmm. I'll probably make biscuits for dinner tonight. So we're having uh -huh. chicken. Mm -hmm. What kind of bagels did you make? Um, I made plain for me or for Dennis and everything for me. It's always mm -hmm. the same here, half and half. <laughs> and so do you somehow have to steam the bagels in the oven? No, you boil them. You like pretzels. Them. You boil them and then you bake them. Mm -hmm. Boiled then baked. Hmm. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. I've never made my own bagel either. <laughs> no, bagels are pretty interesting. I um, It's taken me a while, but I have it down. It's easy to do. 
and they, they take only flour, water, something sweet, salt, and yeast. And so mm. it doesn't take much to make them. You don't need anything special. You don't need a lot of eggs or milk or butter. It's just flour, water, yeast, salt, and the sweetener. So it's pretty easy. And how many rises do they go through? A uh, one just overnight. One. Mm -hmm. Oh, overnight? Mm -hmm. Oh, how interesting. Yes. Hmm. I mean, you could do it during the day, but it's really eight hours of cold rise. Cold mm -hmm. rise. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Good. These scientific questions should go to Steve Oswald. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your favorite type of pie? Do you have a favorite? You know, I get asked that question all the time and it's like favorite children, you know, <laughs> I'm not supposed to answer that, but it's really a more complex question. I, um, I definitely respond to the passing parade, like cherries. Oh, I want a cherry pie mm. <laughs> or, you know, it's winter. I want something with squash. It's just has to do with whatever the season and whatever I'm seeing in the market, what's in my refrigerator. That's more what drives my pie. Do you ever freeze your pie crust or do you always make it fresh? I make three at a time. I've learned that I can make three pie crusts in my food processor before I have to wash it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of dishwashing and everything for me is how to get to where I'm going without making too many dishes. And <laughs> so I use a scale so I can weigh the ingredients directly into the food processor um, bowl. And then I can do that three times and then it gets goopy and, and it doesn't make a nice pie crust anymore. So I will make three, one to use and two to freeze. Mm -hmm. So you actually make it in a food processor, not like in a mixer. Yeah, not in a mixer. Because you want the butter piece to be to chunky. Stay chunky, you don't want to mix it with a paddle like that. Uh huh. Interesting. Yeah. And I actually, uh, have, I've given up on making my own pie crust. Well, you're not alone. Um, yeah. I, I call it dophobia. Mm -hmm. And the most famous dophobic is Nora Ephron, who mm -hmm. swore she would never make a pie crust. And she was a very accomplished cook, but she saw no reason to do it. So she only ever bought it. And, and I'm not here to pie shame anyone. <laughs> I, I think everybody should make pie. I have tried to make it many times, but then it never ends up as good as the one that I buy from the store. So... <laughs> Though my pies are better than the store pies, but the crust is another story. It's just a technique. It's mm. not a, it's not a God-given skill or, or talent, really. It's just something like any kitchen skill that with practice, you get better at it. Maybe I should keep trying, I know. Mm. But pies are too precious for me to not have a, a great Perfect. crust. <laughs> well, in pie squared, I turn... Oh, we've lost you again. First, um, as well as cookies. And um, I'm sorry, we lost you for a moment there. Could you start over? Yeah, I said in the book Pie Squared, I offered several alternatives to, um, to traditional uh, pie doughs. Have you lost me again? No, I hear you oh, now. Okay. And uh, that included several that pressed in, some made with crackers, some made mm. with cookies, and an olive oil crust that you can mix up with a fork and press in that's just terrific, and a shortbread crust. So you don't only have to roll out a pie crust. There are other ways to uh, have a crust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you come from a line of, of bakers? Did your mother or your parents do a lot of baking? No, I was always the baker in the family. My, um, my mother always made pies and tarts and my grandmother made pies. My other grandmother, not many things. Uh, she was more of a savory cook. So I, I think I picked up baking early. I, babysitters taught me how and I was self-taught. I just always baked. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Does um, anybody else have, have any questions other. here? I Let's see, I have a question here from the, the group chat. One What's moment. The, 
Oh, it's your cars. I had to let my dog out. He's <laughs> like, he's at the door going, ah! <laughs> oh. So we have a question here from Lucy. It's what is the easiest galette or pie to start with as a pie amateur? Um, in the book, there are several fruit pies and really a, a fruity galette is super easy. I wish we could play the video because I made one in five minutes on the video. Um, start with a store-bought crust if you want and always put down a layer of something to absorb some of the juice in the bottom of a fruit galette. So breadcrumbs are my go-to because I always have them. But if you wanted to crush up cookies, you could do that like amaretto cookies or shortbread, any kind of cookie, put that on the bottom. Biscoff, those are great. And then um, stir fruit and sugar and cornstarch and a little lemon juice together and quickly get it into the middle of that dough. Because the longer the sugar sits on the fruit, the juicier it gets and the messier it's gonna get. So do it fast so it doesn't get all juicy and then just pull the sides up and you have a galette and it's ready to go. I like to freeze them for a little bit before they go in the oven because it helps them hold their shape. I do have a question here from Facebook. Have you ever used bagel dough to make filled recipes? Oh, I'm Martini. playing around with, <laughs> I'm trying to get, make a perfect recipe for a bagel dog right now. Is that what you would mean? <laughs> and, and, I'm curious I mean, about that too. Is that what, I guess that's a filled bagel, certainly. <laughs> sort of. I mean, bagels are a little hard. You can't, the filling doesn't work in the same way. I was trying when I made the cinnamon raisin bagels to see if I could get them to swirl the way cinnamon raisin bread swirls. It just doesn't really work the same way because of the technique needed and so on. So the closest I'm gonna to come to a, a filled bagel is probably a bagel dog. Anything? Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I wish we could play that video. I made a uh, um, yum. I tried again and it still won't play. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I play, I, um, I've been making blackberry peach galettes. That's a Ooh, really nice combination. That is a good combination. Um, I've been like crazy for the berries this year. They've been so beautiful here. We haven't had a lot of rain and evidently that's good for berries. Oh. So I, one weekend, when we were trying to make the video, but somebody didn't press the button, um, I made a bumbleberry galette and that's blueberry, blackberry and raspberry or actually Ooh. any three berries together. That one was particularly delicious. Yeah. That sounds delicious. Yeah. I made, this was my year to make strawberry rhubarb pie. Oh. And so I made quite a few strawberry rhubarb pies this year and they were really, really good. Has anybody else been making pie? Anybody want to chime in? Any pie makers out there? Pardon? I was asking if anybody else has been making pie. It's been a joyful summer for that. A lot of baking, a lot of pie making. I was making mini galettes for a while, just about this big around and carrying those around the neighborhood. That's so sweet. Oh. Can galette be frozen? Yes. Janice asks. Yes, absolutely. You can freeze it and pull it out anytime and just pop it into the oven frozen. Never defrost your pies. That'll make them soggy. Oh. Do straight oven to freeze uh, or freezer to oven. Just like you would with one of those ones that you buy at the grocery store. Yes, so. Mm -hmm. And so do you, you're not freezing a cooked pie. You're you can just do either, but I prefer to freeze them before they're cooked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then do you have to add time, extra time to the baking? Not usually, but it's always best to use visual cues versus time mm. to determine when something's done. And a pie is done, in my estimation, a pie is done either 
when it overflows the pan and drips into the bottom of the oven. That always it. means it's done <laughs> because you want the filling not to be vaguely hot, but to be seriously bubbling. Yeah. You want hot filling because that's going to activate the cornstarch and everything else to thicken your fruit. And if uh -huh. it doesn't cook long enough, that fruit's never going to get thickened and it's going to be a sloppy pie. Oh, interesting. And the other thing is people tend to underbake their crust. The crust should be quite brown like really brown. You want it crispy and flaky and buttery, not mushy. Now, how do you achieve a perfectly baked lower and upper crust? Sometimes uh, I'll get a dark upper and then like kind of a right. know, doughy under. You need, that's called a soggy bottom. Um, <laughs> a soggy bottom. And you need to bake a pie from the bottom up as well as from the top down. Now, years ago, Rose Levy Berenbaum suggested that you bake a pie either on the floor of your oven or on the very lowest rack. And so that started me thinking about how to achieve a really good crispy based pie. But what really um, sealed the deal for me was a, one day I have a, a, a tool called a baking steel and it is exactly the same as a pizza stone except that it's steel instead of ceramic. And I use it to bake bread and to make pizzas. And I had left it in the oven, but I preheated the oven to 425 for the pie. And I opened it and I wasn't gonna move 15 pounds of 425 degrees steel. So I was working at the time on pie squared and that was a slab pie made in a metal baking pan, you know, uh, nine by 13. And so I just slid that pan on top of the baking steel. And when the pie came out, it was so crispy on the bottom that I could lift it out of the entire pan and slide it out onto a cutting board. And it was like this moment, this revelation that all I needed to do was cook the pie on a hot surface. Now there are huh. some caveats. You can't put a ceramic or glass pan on a hot metal if it's been cold, you know, you can't take like a pie from the freezer in a Pyrex glass pan and put it on top of a hot surface, it will crack. But if you have your pie on a metal pan and like a galette is usually on a metal baking sheet, you can just slide that baking sheet right on top of a hot metal surface. Now, maybe you don't have a baking steel or you don't travel with it when you vacation on Martha's Vineyard but you can always flip another baking sheet over. Uh -huh. So it, and just flip it over and heat it up with when you're preheating the oven. So it's screaming hot. And then you put the other one on top of it and you get that nice hot surface. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you pre-bake your crusts for fruit pies? Sometimes, it depends. It depends on the fruit, it depends on the crust. I mean, so- How do you make that determination? Uh, you read all the recipes in my book. <laughs> <laughs> you buy my book and read the recipes. <laughs> I mean, some, there are custards, are there cream pies that don't get baked, you know, True. like pudding okay. pie kind of things. Mm -hmm. So yes, you do pre-bake those. We've lost you again. I know. I don't You'll just see, have to keep talking. Okay, there I am. There we go. <laughs> um, uh, there are some, I think I'm gone again. There are some pies that uh, bake for a very short period of time. And then, so you need to par bake your crust so that it has enough time to get crispy. Uh-huh, interesting. Have you encountered, encountered or invented any flavor combinations that were unconventional and were more delicious than you expected? Ask Steve. Uh, for sure. I decided to play around with what are called compound butters as the base for the pie crust. And that for me, I thought was pretty revolutionary. I hadn't seen it anywhere else. I made a caramelized onion compound butter, froze it Ooh. and cut it up and then made pie crust out of that. So it had a very like Lipton onion soup kind of vibe. Um, which was delicious with- What did you make in the pie itself? 
did you make like a quiche or? Uh, well, the one, that, the one that really blew all of my girlfriends away that we called our once a month pie was the baked, loaded baked potato mm -hmm. slab pie in a caramelized onion crust. Oh, that that made... sounds so good. Is that recipe in the book? That's in pie squared. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> um, so that, that felt pretty revolutionary to me. And I tried a lot of other combinations I, that didn't work, some did. I got cheddar cheese into the dough and then I mushed and I did cheddar cheese with the onion. I did an everything spice dough, which other people have done since. Uh, but I think that the idea to put a compound butter in a pie crust was for me like the, the biggest uh, revelation. And do you typically go savory with the compound butters or do you ever do like a cinnamon? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, Martha Stewart did a cinnamon roll pie crust thing where she rolled up the dough and it, so it was spiraled with the cinnamon sugar and then cut it and then laid out all the little circles to make the top crust for an apple pie. And I thought that was a pretty cool idea, but it wasn't really speaking to me with the combinations that I had in the book. So uh -huh. most of the compound butter work was for uh, savory pies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems like almost it, it might work better in that. Respect. In many cases, yeah. yeah. I thought lemon might work, but it really didn't. It um, mm. charred. It was sort of a burned lemon flavor, which wasn't appealing. Uh huh. It must be fun to experiment, though. Sometimes. Sometimes, <laughs> it's, sometimes it's a sad day with a call to the pizza place. <laughs> Uh, we have a question from Facebook from Becky. My mom used to tell me not to overwork the pie dough. What is overworking dough? Yeah, isn't that a good question? Mm -hmm. I think there's so many mysteries around pie dough. Uh, there's like, you know, uh, combine the butter and the flour until it looks like peas, corn. Uh, I don't know. There, like so many things, sand. And this is where I got... I found people were really frustrated. Those words didn't mean anything. And so when I developed my pie crust technique in the food processor, I know that you like pulse the food processor precisely 15 times and you have what I want you to have. Um, overworking the pie dough means that you begin to develop the gluten strands that you look for in bread. And that makes a bready crust instead of a layered and flaky crust. Uh -huh. um, a lot, and so what happens is people are so afraid to work their dough that they put together crumbs and kind of mush it and wrap it up in plastic and think that magically that will become dough and it won't. I mean, you have to work it enough to get it to collect. And then the chilling that happens relaxes everything and gives mm -hmm. you back your flaky. You wanna make sure there are still pieces of butter in there but you have to really collect the disc or the block or however it is you're putting that dough together. I have a YouTube video, um, look up Kathy Barrow on YouTube and you can see how to make dough, it's on there. And for me, that um, uh, learning to work it a little bit more than I thought I should was a revelation. And the other thing I found is that when you form that disc or block or whatever, and you form it based on where it's going, are you going to roll it out into a rectangle? Don't make a round thing. Are you going to roll it out to something round? Don't make a square thing. Like start with where you want to go. So if you have a disc, you want, so to knock, you want to knock the edges on the counter so that they smooth. Because then when you start rolling it, you don't get that crackly, like, a dry edge that mm -hmm. falls apart. But if you have, have tightened the edges of your disc or your block, and then you start to roll, it won't have that uh, effect. And how do you, I don't understand the tightening the edges of- Okay, imagine this is it, right? I go- Uh-huh, with your dough? Yeah. Oh. Knock, knock it right on the counter till it's nice and flat. Mm -hmm. So you have to beat your dough up a little bit. Yeah. Don't hesitate to, to be aggressive with it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. What did you find the most challenging thing about writing a cookbook? Figuring out what to do with 700 pies. 
<laughs> you can't yeah. eat them all. Not at all. We lived in a condo through most of writing these books and that was helpful because I could just take them to the mail room. But mm -hmm. now that I'm working on the bagel book and I've made a hundred dozen bagels easily in the last like four months, three months, I and I'm living in a city where I don't know a lot of people yet. And I'm sure it's too weird to say, hey, I'll leave some bagels on my porch. So that's been a challenge. I have mailed things, I've mailed bagels to people have all you. over the country. Yeah. I find it's also difficult. Like I enjoy cooking a lot and sharing what I make, but now we're not really allowed to share what we make at work mm -hmm. because of the coronavirus. And right. I'm sure it's a lot harder to unload those bagels because of it. It is, <laughs> it is. So now I, I think that um, I, I don't want to sound flip, but for me, writing isn't really hard. It's really something that uh, gives me a lot of pleasure. So I don't think any part of writing a book has been hard for me. Uh, there are challenging days. There are recipes that I have to make 18, 20 times to get right, but uh, but I like it. I like the exploration. I like figuring out the language that will make um, making this recipe easy for people or or enjoyable or at least exciting. Um, so that for me is fun. When you're making the recipes, do you typically measure initially? Do you always measure when you bake very precisely or are you kind of throwing things together and then you have to figure out again how you did it? No, I, I weigh my ingredients, weigh. first of all. Uh -huh. I don't measure. Weight is always consistent. It means uh -huh. that I weigh True. 400 grams today, and then I weigh 400 grams tomorrow, it's going to be consistent. Whereas, yeah. you know, three cups is very, it, it, it can vary, even hmm. with the weather. So uh, I use weights. I write my recipes before I go in the kitchen, usually uh -huh. based on ratios that I know, or I can assume, or things that I think will work. But then sometimes, you know, you have to make it again with a half a teaspoon less of something, or a quarter of a teaspoon more of something, or in grams, if you add seven grams, but it's only a third of a teaspoon, how do you adjust so that it's a measurement that people can use, like a quarter or a half? And exactly. so then you have to make it on both sides and see, does the does it make a difference? Interesting. So uh, in the cookbook, is it actually in grams or do you translate it over? It's both. It's both, both, but I always recommend getting a scale. It's mm -hmm. the best $20 you'll ever invest. Interesting. Do you do I the have a hallelujah from anybody else out there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start doing that. I have a little scale that yeah. I've never used for baking, but I will try okay, it now. So the other thing about having a scale, this is... Remember my thing about dishwashing? Remember what I said? Okay, <laughs> you put your bowl on the scale uh -huh. and then you weigh your ingredients and you hit the button and it goes back to zero uh -huh. and you weigh more ingredients. You've never used a cup measure. You've never touched anything. You've just like poured the That's sugar That's fascinating. I was bag. just thinking about how you would do that because how would you not get the weight of whatever you're putting your ingredients in? You just and that's it. how you do it. Use the the tar or tear. Tear. Mm -hmm. Tear. Yeah. yeah. Do you do the beating of the dough after it because after it comes out of the refrigerator? Pie dough. Yes. No, no. It, you make it ahead, and oh, you mean the rolling? When you're you know when you're knocking it to get it tight. That's before I chill it. That's before you're making chill. the initial disc. I make the dough, I make a disc, and then it goes in to get chilled. Now, okay. some people roll their dough out ahead of chilling. Dory Greenspan, I believe, does that. She rolls her dough between two sheets of parchment paper and then freezes or refrigerates it to chill it before she proceeds to make the pie. And mm -hmm. I think that that's a very, a, a really interesting solution and it works well. For me, I have room in my freezer more frequently for a disc of dough than I have for a whole pan of rolled out dough. So for me, that the kind of practicality can really drive my recipe writing. But chilling is definitely essential. It, essential, it helps everything relax. It makes the butter get cold again. Mm -hmm. And the cold butter, the reason you want that is that when you mix the butter and the flour and the water together and you have that 
piece of butter and you put it in a hot oven, the butter steams and kind of explodes oh. and it creates the flaky layers as it does uh -huh. that. And if the butter's all mushy and melted, it just kind of and it smears. And so you want it's that. It's kind of cold. greasy sometimes I've noticed. Exactly. So it needs to be cold. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right, everybody is mute, half mute, I can't see. <laughs> People are, are writing into the group chat their questions oh, mainly. That's very nice, thank you. I wish I could make pie for everybody. You know, that's what I used to do on these book tours. I, I'm so sad you're not here in person because I love pie. Yes. I would love to try your pie. Now I have to make my own version of your pie. That's right, yeah. you're all going to have to do that. So I can um, post the video on my youtube channel later of making it okay back. that would be great or i actually i told people if they want to provide their email address i'm okay. happy to send it to them as well super and how can people get your book uh well i suggest of course bookshop.org which is independent booksellers um organized together you just go right on there and order it through bookshop.org and they'll find an independent bookseller to send it to you of course, there's Amazon or whatever independent bookstore is near you on the vineyard. That's a bunch of grapes. Mm -hmm. And what's your connection to the vineyard? Oh, my very best friend had a house in Edgartown, and I've been going there for, I mean, every summer and fall for 35 years, maybe. Oh, wow. She sold it about four years ago, and that was very heartbreaking. Oh, <laughs> but you still, have you been back since then? Or I you have. Were just you mm -hmm. have. Yeah. And where do you stay now? I like Edgar Town because I know it so well. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's a good walking town. It is a great walking town. A great it's... bicycle from there. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Yeah. It's actually still very, very busy this year. Is it? That's interesting. It's, That's it's very busy here. It might not be as busy as the past years, but it's still packed on the island. Hmm. It's, it's a lot of people here. Yeah. I never, <laughs> I used to go in early June and late September. That, that's a good time, especially late September can be amazing. If you have a good September on the vineyard, that's like, ah, that's the time. Well, I don't see that we have any other questions. And so I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you so much for being here, Kathy. It's been a pleasure and I've really learned a lot, I must okay. say. You've inspired me to get baking. I don't have air conditioning in my house, so I don't bake in the summer. It's far too hot, but I'm looking forward to baking again as soon as I can. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure being here. Nice to see all of you, old friends, new friends, all of you. Thank you all for being here and, and please join us again. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Kathy. Bye-bye.